Serious question, is it me or has there been a lot of talk as of late about keeping things old school? Now you and I did just that when we looked at a vehicle, what, about two weeks ago, that hasn't changed any appreciable amount since 1979. And I don't know about you, but that experience for me was very homey, so let's try it again. But this time, let's look at a vehicle, aside from getting a lot fancier, hasn't changed a whole hell of a lot since 1957. Here we go, got a big number for you. 5,815 pounds, going straight uphill. This is good for 381 horsepower, comes in at 5,600 RPM. Uh, but the torque, 401 pounds, comes in at 3,600 RPM. This is a lazy V8. It doesn't quite have the that je ne sais quoi of modern V8s, but 90% of that figure comes in at 2200 RPM, 10.2 to 1 compression ratio, and any transmission you want as long as it's an 8-speed automatic. You gotta push it hard. If you push it hard, you get power out of it. If you're expecting too much out of it just by hitting it with a little, little throttle, this ain't your around town cruiser. Anything that generally holds the wheels on to a given vehicle that you and I drive very important part of these episodes. Much more important part of this episode today because this is something that's designed to go into war zones. So we're gonna piecemeal the suspension stuff. Let's start with the front, a double wishbone with coil springs and a stabilizer bar. Well, this is as good a time as any to discuss steering. So you know how we drive these new fangled fancy crossovers? Uh, the nicest way I could put this all of the steering in those things is vague on center feel. That is kind of a throwaway term that most car people use. There's no feel in the steering of those things because they're so over boosted and it's just too light. This is from a time gone by, from like back in the day of hydraulic steering where you felt the steering, you felt the weight of the front of the vehicle. And that's because we're so used to driving vehicles with E-Pass, electric power steering. Even 911s have it now. Here, it feels like an older system. There's a weight to it, and the weight, it has more to do with the size and heft of the vehicle than in the back. It is a four-link unit, but don't confuse that with independent because, you know, you think BMW and Mercedes, and I say five-link, that's an independent system. This is not. Uh, then you add to that coil springs and stabilizer bar. There was a comment in the Kia Telluride episode where someone says, why do you guys keep on making a huge distinction between crossovers and sport utility vehicles? The buying public, they don't really care or know the difference. Well, here's the thing. You do know the difference if you buy a vehicle like that. Like when you drive a, an Atlas, that guy bought a tall Passat. He is expecting that vehicle to drive like a Passat. This vehicle is not a tall Passat. It's not a tall Camry. As a result, driving it around town, I feel that pothole. Even on a perfect road like this, I feel a little pitch, squat, dive, roll as I'm going around even the most mild of turns. That's what an SUV does. And before we go back to driving, a very important thing here. This ain't all-wheel drive. It ain't intelligent something or other where it sends power back and forth. This is four-wheel drive. Like old school, like your grandfather's grandfather had and it separates the torque 40, 60 back there. My guess is someone who would buy this probably would tow a horse trailer or a toy trailer or have the use of a trailer for some other thing that they would buy. Uh, and to those people, I share with you uh, that the tow rating of this is 8,100 pounds. As a basis of comparison, that's significantly more than most of those like mid-size or mid-plus size crossovers we've been driving. That's better by 3,000 pounds. Then you have the wheels and tires, 285-60 R18s. The brakes, 13.9 inch diameter rotors in the front, 13.6 in the back. Uh, please do not try this at home. We got a bit of a straight here and no one behind us and panic stop. Okay. There's definitely a lot of dive, as you saw, but you would expect that 
with a vehicle that has the ground clearance of uh, 8.9 inches, uh, very high center of gravity and that much weight. But overall, pedal feel was surprisingly good. And I will tell you, driving it around town, it's not like you're working hard with the brakes to bring this almost 6,000 pounds down to a stop. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game in mind, the options game. But this round is going to be special for two reasons. Number one, probably one of the shortest rounds of this game we've ever played in the history of the game. And number two, it's going to be surprising. That I promise. So with it, let's start. 2019 Toyota Land Cruiser, four-wheel drive SUV V8 for a manufacturer's suggested retail price of $84,760. Yes, that sounds an awful lot like $85,000. Uh, this one is classic silver metallic with a beige interior. I'd like to point out that the Terra semi aniline perforated leather interior is fitted as standard. The only option fitted to this vehicle is the rear seat entertainment system. At that, it has these cool little slip covers, much like your uh, grandmother's couch, for $2,200. To that, we add the delivery processing handling fee, $1,295 for a total retail price of $88,260. So what have we learned in this very short round of the options game? Well, the oldest Toyota model in the lineup, the one that's gone the longest without a change, is also the most expensive by a long shot. What do they say with fancy cars? If you have to ask, you can't afford it. Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. 13.1 average MPG. That's driving it around town. Before I let you go on that point, 13.1 uh, MPG is actually a bit better than what the federal government calls this thing. They call it for 13 in the city, 18 on the highway. 15 combined. Um, Remember when we said the Kia Telluride had pretty bad fuel economy at, what, 24? So sue me, I indeed joke around a lot in all the Hyundai and Kia episodes that they are a steel company masquerading as a car company. And that really is not a joke because they're in a unique position in that they can put a lot of high strength steel, which is expensive, in an inexpensive car, giving them a competitive advantage. You look at the likes of General Motors, Ford, Toyota, they can't do that. The most Toyota has done is that polymer hatchback that they put in the uh, Corolla. And then there's Ford, they've done the Ford F-150 all in aluminum, which raised the price of that vehicle. We come back to this and obviously we've just done a round of the options game. This is not a cheap vehicle, so there's extra budget there. But really this thing, it's designed to go to war zones and that's just not a joke. You look on any news channel you want, these are the things the UN goes and negotiates for refugees, and these are the things in war zones. So Toyota has taken that budget and put a lot of high strength steel. It's in the A pillar, the B pillar, the C pillar, and even the D pillar, but they don't stop there. All of the rocker on either side, that's all high strength steel. So if you really think about the logic, the high strength steel is not generally used as a competitive advantage. It's used for real world stress points in a vehicle that goes to places you and I would never even imagine to go to. No reason we can't go over a couple of locks here. I have been going over parking berms while I've been doing this. Uh, let's try a little bit off-roading here. Uh, this is down right on the edge of Terranea Bay and Apparently we have an audience. I don't know where these guys are coming from. I've never seen these guys here before. That's 
incredibly cool. Hi guys! Apparently they like land cruisers, especially these guys over here. Hi guys! You guys like land cruisers? Oh, it's an electric fence. Well, listen to Ren and Stimpy, don't wheeze on the electric fence. Anyway, while we're here, let's try a little bit off-roading. Not exactly uh, the hardest thing we're going to do here, especially considering the ground clearance on this thing. This was designed to do way more than this. This is about the most we'd get, probably going out to the outback. There's a couple of things that stand out as you drive it off-road. Number one, you don't feel like it's working very hard. Number two, it really doesn't disturb the ride quality all that much, especially in situations like this. And number three, and this is the biggest thing you notice when taking this thing off-road, there's a significant amount of stability to it. That's where that high-strength steel comes into play. I continue to be fascinated by this thing, and one important point has nothing to do with reality. It's what I picture of a Land Cruiser. Like, these things have been around since I was in college. I remember seeing a Toyota dealership across the street from the Honda motorcycle dealership I used to work at, thinking, man, those things are huge. Well, apparently, that idea has stuck in my head because I think of this as the behemoth in the SUV world. Well, apparently, I am dead wrong about this because the wheelbase, 112.2, the overall length, 194.9. Take two cars you and I have driven recently, like the Mercedes GLE 450, a mid-size luxury SUV. In my mind, I think of that as much smaller. Turns out the wheelbase on that is five inches longer. That Kia Telluride, that one's long and low, but it's a crossover, this is a big SUV. Turns out that's two inches longer in overall length. Then there's the important stuff. The ground clearance, 8.9 inches, but all of this like, pales in comparison to the most amazing thing, and that is, how much water can you drive this thing in? Turns out 27.5 inches. That's like right about here. Now, think back to the options game we just played. This is 90 grand, people, and you can drive it up to water here and not void the warranty. As we make our way back to HQ, a note about the UX. So I'm under no delusions that this is a modern day UX. It really is a band-aid approach in a fancy car. It works. And the big reason why it works is A, it's very good stereo. And really the big thing is it's got knobs and buttons and really big knobs at that. The only thing I'd ask for is some toggle switches. But there's a, this one really big drawback. You gotta go into the climate control system and use the screen to up and down, basically work the fan, and you have to take your eyes off the road to be able to do something as simple as put more fresh air in the vehicle. That seems totally counterintuitive, like it's like an afterthought. Like give me one of these, another one of these big honking knobs, or even a toggle switch I'll take, but this? Come on, man, that's kind of out of the theme of Land Cruiser. Remember when I said piecemeal? Well, that was the piece, and this is the meal. So this very fancy vehicle is indeed fitted with traction control and stability control. However, that is not the reason why you and I need to be very excited here, because this 2019 model year vehicle is fitted with technology that is almost as old as the Land Cruiser itself, dating back to 1957. Uh, first and foremost, there's a transfer case under here, two speeds, uh, and number two, there is a torsion limited slip locking differential. Now, why is that important? Well, those two speeds. So in the low gear, there is a crawl speed, but it's not just a crawl speed, there is a crawl assist to it, so one can go in a crawl speed and all they have to focus on is just the steering, not applying the brake. And then similar to that, there's a, a hill descent assist. We've driven this in like everything from Mercedes to Porsches. Uh, but here, it's a similar setup in that it's just the steering. You don't have to worry about the brakes as you're going down a hill. We did this even in the Hyundai Santa Fe. And then while we're on that topic, uh, angle of approach is 32 degrees, angle of departure 24 degrees. Uh, then if that were not enough, there's a trick to improve the turning radius when you're in that crawl mode. And it's not four wheel steer or some kind of accordion with the wheelbase. What it does, it applies a limited amount of brake pressure to the inside rear wheel. Now do you see why Kumo and I are so excited about this thing? And we're sports car people.
back to our torture chamber that is Portuguese Bend. Please don't try this at home. I'm going to push a little bit harder in a vehicle that we probably shouldn't be pushing so hard. This is where we have a lot of imperfections in the road. There's elevation changes. Look at this, man. It's There is composure. Surprisingly, there's composure. But what changes is ride quality. That's where the degradation happens in a sport utility vehicle, specifically this one, over, say, a crossover. If we were to go through there in like a, a CX-9 or that Lexus, smooth as silk, but that Forerunner or this thing, you can see how much my body and head is moving as I go over some of these bibs and bobs, and even the lane keep assist is yelling at me. This, wow, <laughs> okay. It's kind of like a roller coaster with this thing. Super fun, man. I think if you pushed it hard enough, we could probably get some air. But there's definitely compression of the shocks there. God, this thing is so fun. I love the Land Cruiser. 